he was definitely guilty. All of the witnesses, um, they were able to, you know, to, to ID him as, as the person who actually did it. It took a jury only a few hours to decide Troy Davis was guilty of murdering a police officer in Savannah, Georgia, and a few more hours to send him to death row. But a number of witnesses have signed affidavits changing their original testimony. There is no credible evidence outside of these witnesses' testimony. When the witnesses recant that testimony, there's no case left. Given what we know about their unreliability, a case involving eyewitness identification alone and no physical evidence that ties the suspect to the crime are just not appropriate to be tried as capital cases. These young teenagers, these black teenagers at the police station in the middle of the night knowing a white officer has been killed, in one case five officers and one 15-year-old. Um, in an interrogation room. The witnesses have testified that they were subject to undue police pressure or coercion. Daryl Collins is one of the prosecution witnesses who signed a police statement implicating Troy Davis. And I told him over and over that this is, I didn't see this happen. They put what they wanted to put in that statement. Many have also said that they were frightened um, and that they just wanted to do what they understood that the police wanted them to do by identifying Troy Davis. Almost all of the prosecution's star witnesses have changed their stories. Dorothy Farrell is one of them, a former prison inmate. She writes, I was scared that if I didn't cooperate with the detective, then he might find a way to have me locked up again. So I told the detective that Troy Davis was the shooter even though the truth was that I didn't see who shot the officer. A witness named Jeffrey Sapp now writes, The police came and talked to me and put a lot of pressure on me to say Troy did this. They made it clear that the only way they would leave me alone is if I told them what they wanted to hear. It doesn't take much imagination to see the fear and terror that would have been in those teenagers' heads in the days immediately following this incredibly charged murder. There's a fundamental amount of uncertainty about the, uh, the truthfulness uh, of the trial testimony. Um, that's a reason uh, to believe the witnesses now. Courts often have difficulty dealing with recantations for valid reasons. It's uh, not always clear why a witness, uh, after the fact, changes his or her testimony. Uh, in this case, however, the number of recantations is truly uh, unprecedented. How come you're talking to me? I admire the fact that you are. Because I don't want to see this innocent man get killed for something he didn't even do. It's a instant fracas at midnight in a fast food lot parking lot. Um, many of the people who are observers don't know any of the people involved in the action before they see what happens, which happens in seconds. So it is fraught with problems of misidentification and confusion and the ability to suggest scenarios that didn't happen. One witness that's particularly compelling is Harriet Murray. She witnessed the entire chain of events that led to the shooting of Officer McPhail. A few hours after the crime, she gave a statement to the police in which she described that a man who had been harassing her boyfriend, Larry Young, also pulled out uh, a gun and pistol whipped Larry Young in the head and then shot Officer McPhail. Multiple witnesses have identified Sylvester Coles as the person who harassed Larry Young. Coles himself admitted at trial that he had a heated argument with Larry Young. In her 2002 affidavit, M Murray reaffirms that what she saw the night of the crime was a man who harassed Larry Young, also was the man she saw shoot Officer McPhail. So we have a witness who said the man who harassed Larry Young is the same person who shot Officer McPhail, and we have other witnesses and 
Coles himself testify that it was Coles who had the argument with Larry Young. This supports an alternative explanation of the crime from the state's case. There is no meaningful physical evidence. At the original trial, the state forensics people testified that bullets from a gun, which allegedly Troy Davis used earlier that evening, the investigator felt like he could say, yes, these bullets that are found at the Officer McPhail scene are so like the bullets at the earlier scene that I think they're from the same gun. At this point in time, Georgia Forensics, having used more modern testing on those two sets of bullets, says they are not, there are not enough discernible similarities to make any statement about their possible relationship. Now that's a stunning development, um, and it calls into question the original verdict. The jurors obviously would have relied on the state's forensic testimony and the state has now withdrawn that testimony. It was reasonable that Troy Davis was treated as a suspect. After all, he was at the crime scene around the time of the crime. Logically, the police would have had questions about his actions and his whereabouts. Amnesty International has never taken a position on Troy Davis's guilt or innocence. As a human rights organization, we are concerned because there are far too many questions, contradictions, and testimony that point to alternative explanations of the crime. By human rights standards, this is simply unacceptable for a crime punishable by death. Only one thing is crystal clear about this case. There is overwhelming doubt. If I knew then what I know now, Troy Davis would not be on death row. It, the verdict would be not guilty. Mm -hmm.